right, welcome back to UAP Studies Podcast. I am Louis Borges. Joining me as always, my good friend and colleague, Jason Gilman. How's it going, my man? It's going really well. It's yeah. uh, It's been a big week, eh? We've had lots of people contacting us, and uh, we recently launched our YouTube channel. So initially, we would record a, a video of the podcast, but we only released the audio. Now we're going back and editing all those uh, uh, videos and posting them on YouTube. Yeah. And the feedback has been amazing. I mean, I can, I, I know you've had some people reach out to you as well, right? I, I did. So people on Twitter, people on Instagram, and uh, I mean, we're doing our best to get back to people as much as we can. And I think we've been doing a pretty good job of that. But uh, yeah, we're, you know, it's growing. Definitely the community's growing. Yeah. And uh, I can honestly say, I think we have some of the most polite and well-spoken um, commentary. We don't really have any idiots. I've had a few posts that I think was spam trying to get me to buy Bitcoin in Russia. But other than that, it's been <laughs> you guys rock, wicked guests. We love George Knapp. And uh, we, I, I'll approve everybody's comments. As long as you're not spam or a total idiot, I'll approve the comment. Everyone has their, I think it's this, I think it's this. And we need that collective thought in order for this to keep gaining movement. So we're not here to censor anyone. We keep a, a humble opinion on things ourselves. We don't know. Nobody's an expert on this. But it's that discussion that's gonna gonna get us towards that. So, uh, and again, for our um, dedicated podcast followers, we are on YouTube now. Just go to YouTube, search UAP Studies Podcast. You'll see our video lineup um, again, and it's the full recording. It's no different than the podcast, but you get to see the guest. And with the body language, you know, you get a little bit more out of that video. And if you're like my wife that can't focus on an hour long podcast, <laughs> video is a nice alternative to that. So. My wife as well. She's, she has the same thing. She has to watch the podcast. She can't just listen to it. She gets bored. So yeah, it was both funny the other board. day. You're like, oh, my wife came to me and said, oh, honey, you know, I we had a great day. I listened to a couple of podcasts and you said, yeah, which episodes? And she's like, oh, no, it was Joe Rogan. He was yeah. talking with Michio Kaku. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, that hurts a little bit, you know? Yeah, your 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 wife saying that she got a really good kiss today and you're like, by who? Oh, it yeah. wasn't you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pretty thanks, hon. Yeah, thanks, hon. I appreciate that. I was going to say we have a really great uh, guest today that uh, yes, you've been talking back and forth with. Uh, why don't you explain a little bit about our guest today? Yeah, so I've seen Omar Lara on a couple of shows. He was on uh, Luis Elizondo's uh, Unidentified, the History Channel program. Uh, I've seen him on some other shows as well. And anytime we can get somebody from the military who's obviously a trained observer, has a reputation that they're not going to just talk about stupid stuff, uh, whenever you can get their opinion, their perspective, and especially as a firsthand uh, witnesser and somebody with the guts to come forward, you know, that we interviewed Sean Cahill a little while back, the chief, ma chief master at arms uh, on the Princeton and uh, that boat was, um, you know, significant in the observing and recording of the Tic Tac video. Well, Omar also had a, a similar experience on the USS Nimitz. And uh, so we're going to talk to him about that. Uh, and he'll explain a little bit about what's this, what does this mean and what's happening and right. what does he think? So without further ado, I want to welcome to the show uh, a good friend of ours, Omar Lara. Hello. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for doing. It. I know you're a busy guy and uh, you probably have a lot of requests and uh, we get a lot of requests from people wanting to come on the show, but we wanted to keep a, a certain level of credibility with uh, with who we have and you definitely meet that bar. So yeah. so tell us a little bit about yourself. This is your show. So uh, what is what do our listeners need to know about Omar Lara? Uh, just like anyone else out there, um, always looking looking for the uh, UAP and slash ufo phenomenon what this really is and uh sometimes i believe whether or not i guess is if the world is truly um uh, ready to to understand what this is like i like just like you said in your intro we're not experts i never say i'm an expert i always get asked did you see an alien and i say no i did not i saw technology that has surpassed or has been ahead of us for for time as as we know it. You know that the maneuverability and the capability of that object when it just dropped out from the sky and landed about fifteen to forty feet above the waterline and shot off to the right, made an acute angle and exploded right back to where it came from, with no sonic boom, no noise, nothing. It was just uh, something that I I can relive. Even as I'm telling the story, like I can relive that moment as well as the 
the birth of my children. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. And, and to sort of fill in the blank. So for those of you who have seen the Tic Tac video, it's the uh, Navy fighter jets uh, infrared footage of it. But sort of the backstory of that is you guys were doing, was it like uh, like war drills or just simulations out there? Is that what? Yes, we were preparing were to head back into the Persian Gulf and it was either Comp2X or JTFX. I kind of mix up the two. But um, it was during, as from what I've learned since 2017 from my initial interview, what I've learned is that we had an entire week of these objects dropping in and out of our sky coming in from the Malibu area. And I've only known that from listening and talking to Mr. Kevin Day, who I was actually associated with, but being so large in the battle group, yeah. I never saw him. You know, he was on, on a small ship compared to the aircraft carrier. So from what I hear, that was an entire week and I was not privy to any of the radar sightings or anything. You know, I'm just a, I was just a kid out of Los Angeles on my four, four to five years into the service, running around the flight deck, dodging these things and making sure, you know, they land and take off in a safe manner and no one gets killed. Yeah. And apparently on the USS Princeton, um, which was the boat that Sean Cahill was the chief. Yes, yes, I have listened to that gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he was on our show, super well spoken, very intelligent guy, very believable guy. I don't think he yeah. embellished anything. He's about as humble as it gets. But um, that, that ship had brand new state of the art radar systems installed on it. And again, if the military is going to spend a fortune on new gear, it's going to have more layers of detection than the old gear. So maybe because of that, they actually saw these on radar that they never could before, or who knows, maybe they just got lucky, but you know, yeah, point. they had seen, they'd seen these radar tracks. There's been reports and all that. Finally, they got tired of it and scrambled jets because it was more than just an anomaly or glitchy new equipment. They start to think like there's something here and they, they scrambled the jets and that's the footage everybody's familiar with. And uh, but again, tell us about your incident, because your incident happened a couple of days later or within the same week after that, like there was a man overboard. And so tell us yes. a little bit about that story. Yes. So as I always say, if I recall correctly, I do know that it was the last night of our operations for that training due to the fact that all the jets had uh, basically flown off the aircraft carrier. They don't always they don't go back with the aircraft carrier when we're in port they'll fly off and go back to their home base and they leave one jet behind and he's like the alert six. And he's just basically like our watch standard, making sure that no one is flying in our vicinity as we're heading back into our home port and he can basically intercept any uh, hostile. So a man overboard was called off and during that time, everything is kind of lackadaisical. The tempo is very slow down. We're doing maintenance. And uh, the flight deck is uh, pretty much empty. And anybody who's up there is just essential and, and finishing up their, like I said, maintenance. And the elevators were being lowered down and a sailor had fallen overboard. Once a sailor falls overboard, you really have to report within, you know, 10 minutes, the entire ship, so they can know exactly who's out there. Right. And if one guy doesn't get his name called or he doesn't report in, they know for sure it's, it's an actual man overboard. But we actually saw this guy, like we went over to the deck edge and we saw this guy like floating out and the current took him way out. Wow. And that is the only reason why we saw this thing, which I've never said his name on any other show, but his name is Rick Palmer. I've actually spoken to him via text. We haven't talked live yet. He was next to me with, Another guy, I won't say his name yet because I'm still trying to season him. And, and that is the only reason why we saw this object just drop out of the sky because we were looking in that vicinity. Because if we weren't looking, we would have never seen it. No one would have ever seen it. And it dropped out. Like I said earlier, it landed about 40 to 50 feet above the waterline. Zoomed back off. It lasted about 8 to 15 seconds. So if you're staring at the night sky for 8 to 15 seconds, that's a long time. Yeah. yeah yeah what size was uh this object like if you had to gauge how big this thing was i've always got this from a great i guess analogy or description of it was from dave Bade. he asked me if he held a quarter up 
to the night sky, how big was it? I go, it was exactly the size of a quarter compared to the stars. Right. So roughly that's pretty big. And it, if it was in the daytime, I would say maybe the size of an H-53, which is one of our lar- largest helos on board oh, wow. uh, aircraft carriers. Yeah. And it maneuvered like that at that speed. Oh, faster. It was, oh, wow. uh, it was, I mean, I, I always, I can't really describe anything else to as fast. So for, whenever someone always tells me, hey, something is that fast, I, I always think to myself, it's not that fast, you know, because yeah. I, I think of just this thing dropping, playing itself for those eight to 15 seconds and then just shooting right back off to the right, stopping on a dime again, and then sh- making this like acute angle, not a 90 degree, more of an acute and shooting right back off with this trajectory where it just started traversing the sky. And then all of a sudden it got so pulling up at high that it just disappeared and it was it was gone. Yeah. And you're in the middle of the ocean at that point. It's pitch black everywhere. You can see this thing very clearly maneuvering like that. So that's what does that do to you as you're witnessing this? Does that put together all like the E.T. movies we've seen as a kid and sort of go, they're real? Or as a military person, are you kind of going, we're fucked? (laughs) Like at that moment, at that moment, I know. So at that moment, as it dropped in, even the guy who had the spotlight on the sailor overboard, he illuminated this object as well. So he saw it there too. Right. But when it happens so fast between those, you know, 15 seconds, we're conditioned in the service to react. And at that moment, when you see something like that, it's just so, so real. It just happens so fast. But as soon as it took off, our alarm systems went off for a general quarters. When I heard that, it, you just go right back into, you know, your condition. I don't want to say brain, well, your brainwash, basically. Yeah, yeah. Your that's what to, military to is. Yeah, yes. exactly. And I do re- remember thinking, wow, our radar system saw this thing. They saw this. But I went back to my battle station. I gathered my crew, did our little maintenance thing, and by the time, actually, by the time they called battle stations and to clear all flight deck, non-essential flight deck personnel, because they were going to launch the jet aircraft that was on standby. Because this thing got within our vicinity quick and exited fast. Um, that was about maybe another 20 seconds in between. Right. And it was done. They called them off. They called them both off the general quarters and for the alert six to be launched. And then that's when um, uh, we went back to uh, our uh, maintenance office. And that's when I spoke to, uh, I referred to him as JD and then um, Rick Palmer. And we had a few conversations like, you know, what was that? And JD was like, I remember him saying, you don't believe in that stuff too. That was the first thing he said. And I was like, I don't know, man. I, I think, I guess I, I do now. Right. Yeah. Seeing <laughs> and, is believing, uh, right? Yes. And he was always saying, you know, that's Russian or Chinese. And I said this many times, I replied to him. I said, that's Russian or Chinese. Like you said earlier, we're fucked. We're, yeah. we're no longer one of the premier superpowers for air power on the globe, on the planet, because whatever that is, if it's Chinese or Russian, we should have been done years ago because this thing is just so advanced. Yeah. Yeah. And why, you know, they're at war right now with Ukraine. You think some of that technology, if they had it would be showcased or in a new war and they haven't showcased anything like that, but Russia has its own problems with UAPs. China has their own problems with UAPs because it's a global problem. And they're probably thinking on the other side, it's probably America or Russia. And then Russia is probably thinking it's probably America or the Chinese. That's a good propaganda. It's like World War II, the Foo Fighters. They thought it was German. Germans thought it was allied. They're just thinking it's each other's stuff and it's neither. Yeah, but they're very much- I've always wondered whether or not uh, North Korea has their problems with things because they're always launching nukes. Yeah. yeah testing stuff i'm sure he he probably thinks it's us or or you know he probably knows well i've been having these problems since maybe the 50s or 60s 
Yeah, it's it's a global problem. And the thing is, what's more interesting now is that they're getting bold, uh, approaching ships that are in the oceans. I, I know the ships have changed recently. You probably know this a lot more than I do, but there's a lot of nuclear powered ships now uh, out there. And they seem to be very much attracted to nuclear power and nuclear ships. But to be I've to learned point, that too. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, most submarines are nuclear powered. Then they can yeah. stay underwater for infinite amount of time just because yeah. of that. I didn't get to uh, understand that fact until, I, uh, you know, after 2017, I thought it was just an isolated incident. But more and more comes out it's going to probably be harder to get anything out of the subs, the surface Navy, that area. They're not going to release anything, but I'm sure they have these problems yeah. all the time. And all four, you, had a, is, yeah. you had a Maybe. friend as well witness this with you. Uh, you called me about a week ago and said, Hey, I have somebody They're retired now. I'm hoping maybe they could share their story, but there's still quite a bit of fear. And uh, you know, a it lot is. of, a lot of people on the outside think, hey, we have disclosure now. We saw the video. We see Luis Elizondo. We're there. But no. And so either from, I mean, you look at Kevin Day. Uh, we recently uh, interviewed Caroline Corey about her new movie, A Tear in the Sky. And we talked about he looks noticeably shaken from his whole experience. It just messed with his head and it, it, it sort of made it worse and it become almost like a downward spiral. So I'm glad you brought that up. I totally forgot. Soon after we went in, after they called off the uh, flight deck um, to launch the Alert 6 and the general quarters, I went back into the flight deck control area to uh, basically go back into business mode and talk to our fuelie who's in the flight deck control and let them know what fuel stations are being worked on, you know, what's going to be used to defuel something or basically reclaim fuel i can go in depth but it's kind of hard to explain to and um i remember uh <clears throat> i've always tried to find this guy but i just could not get hold of him a yellow shirt walked in and the yellow shirt is the one that handles the aircraft movement on the deck he walks in and he says what the fuck was that and i turned around to look at him and i was actually kind of laughing like oh man he saw this too and i saw another sailor uh, sitting down and he was in prayer and he had this look on his face that he was just he was scared yeah. so you're right you know it, you see something like this it kind of so if all us three got together and we saw this that night we'd probably be like wow look at that now with all the information that we have and that we you know we're basically embedded with this stuff but if you get the general public who's not part of our subculture, uh, they're going to have different reactions. They're going to get scared. And, and that's why I don't think entirely everyone is ready. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. there's people that you work with that even if they experience the same thing that you've experienced with, um, you know, they can dismiss it. And so, some people dismiss it very easily because uh, it doesn't fit the narrative or whatever point of views they have in life. Uh, that would apply to the people that serve on the ship along with you. I know Kevin Day was, he said his career pretty much ended uh, because, you know, he was being teased all the time. People calling him the UFO guy. But to him, this was a legitimate, like, this was a huge deal. And it is a huge deal. The fact that the biggest military in the world, you know, they think about how much technology and power are on these ships, experience these crafts that either follow the, the, the Navy ships or does maneuvers the way that you do, but all within the vicinity of the Navy ship, that is a huge deal. And the fact that it hasn't been really, you know, it's being brought to light now, but it can't just be the Navy. It's got to be the Air Force as well. The Air Force has got to be having encounters like that too. Of course, oh, we don't hear anything. Are. We don't hear anything from the Air Force though. No, right? not like, that. Yeah, I've never heard anything. Just, no, no. Um, but yeah, you figure that they have the same problem. It's only the Navy that's really come out and said, hey, we were having an issue with this, legitimate issue with these things. So I'm, I'm waiting to hear from, from the Air Force. I don't know if we will or not, but it would be nice to hear that they were having the same issue, right? Yes, uh, that tear in the sky, I spoke to Miss uh, Caroline Corey, young lady over the phone and via email, I believe. She asked me to be on her show and our, our, my time difference, I think we were still in COVID or towards the end of it and the filming and I'd already burned 
uh, vacation time. And I think the weekend that they asked me to fly out to California for them, I was on one of the uh, weekend shifts and it was, there was no way we already had like five guys down on COVID and wow. it wasn't going to happen, but I, I've heard different. great reviews of it. And once the kids go to sleep and I get some time, I'm going to watch <laughs> that thing. Yeah, it's it was amazing it. because they basically <laughs> replicated that same tic tac phenomenon. You know, something oh, coming wow. from suborbital level, dropping right above the waterline in like an instant. I mean, we're talking something that would have what two hundred or more G's. Uh, the speeds they clocked were like eight to eighty thousand miles an hour. I mean, this is was like hypersonic on, on uh, radar. Pardon me? Did they get the visual? Both the drone eye? visual oh, radar. Wow night vision in fact they had a genius on there a guy named david mason who invented special technology just to be able to observe this type of thing better uh he wow. took like a, a telescope that would see a light and it would turn it into a waveform so because there's way more detail in that waveform than just a light so like we don't know if it's a plane if it's a star whatever but his machine would give it a unique signature so now every single plane would show up and the computer would recognize that's a 747, that's a 737 because it's a smaller one. And he basically, so they, they were able to weed out all of the known things so that nobody could say, oh, that was just a plane or that was some kind of cosmic phenomenon or whatever. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. I wish yeah, I like they, the private sector. That again. Yeah, and people are spending money on this now and inventing technology so because, again, and I, we mentioned that when we had those guys on the show, too, that good for you for doing that, because, I mean, the government has stuff. But if you think that real disclosure is going to come from them, either they can't or they won't because it implicates them over the last 80 years of just lying, flat out lying, yeah. destroying some people's careers. Everything people has been suspecting would be true if they just come out and say, yeah, you're right. So they're never going to do that. And it's almost like a gradual one day. They'll just be kind of like, yeah, we're just as surprised as you. They're never going to acknowledge all the stuff that they've been keeping. I think. You know what, Omar? We were talking about this. We're saying about the new uh, UAP task force. If anything happens, you know, they would be the ones that would show up and, and, and interrogate or in, investigate the case. But in the case of even the Nimitz, I, I believe somebody was mentioning how within 20 minutes, a helicopter landed on deck. Two civilian looking men came out. They grabbed all the tapes or, or whatever the uh, recordings were and took off again. Right. So that was the organization that was already in place, taking care of these sort of sightings and evidence. They're going to butt heads eventually with the people from the UAP task force, because that group did not go away. You know, they're still right. behind the scenes now. It's just they're going to have to contend with the new group. And are they going to play ball with them? I don't think so. But, you know, there's people that want to keep this quiet as long as possible. And people in the Senate now or Congress that want to bring this to light. So it, we're kind of that weird weird period where there's going to be i don't think friction but definitely head-to-head -head, um competition for the information definitely i remember that i was uh pj Hughes. uh geez we were on the nimbus together for over three and a half years uh, i never met him <laughs> oh, <laughs> and wow. we worked on the flight deck that's just how vast it is but i remember he got so much blowback for for saying that these gentlemen came on board took his tapes I believe I'm, he was validated, if yeah. I'm correct. Yeah, he yeah. was validated, yeah. Yeah, and that group's still out there. Like, that group didn't, yeah. you know, just uh, dissolve or anything. They're still out there doing what they do. But, uh, you know, it's going to be a lot tougher for them to do that now. And, like, people like yourselves from the military and from the Navy, you know, from the Air Force that are coming out and saying, hey, actually, we, we we're witnessing this while we're in service. That is a huge deal, right? Because yes. you guys are out there to protect uh you know uh, the world pretty much from you know other attacks and if you are the top military and you're going we can't compete with this technology that's cause from concern a little bit for the population right saying there's nothing really we can do about it if these things decide to just show up in a neighborhood one day that's pretty much it that's all we can do right we could just pass yeah, it's jets, something, more, it's something more powerful than like mankind right you know yeah. we've, we've come from being nomads to our technology and this thing is still ahead of us or whatever it is is still ahead of us and it's always been ahead of us and yeah i hear whether or not you know maybe they've been indigenous to our planet i've listened um, to uh, i think it was dr eric davis and he talked about how put off theory 
that it was a hominid species. So, you know, it's a beautiful thing to always just speculate what this is and, and all, but the honest truth, it's just a technology that they have that just surpasses anything yeah. on this planet. Yeah. And do you Especially think- Especially with the nukes and they shut down Dr. Robert's- uh, Salas. Robert Salas. Salas. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep, for sure. He's the first guy to go on a record saying that. He, he, uh, he, he was awoken by his sub- uh, I guess his uh, officer below his rank and cause they couldn't figure it out and they're yeah. only supposed to wake him if it's like a dire emergency. And they felt that it was that night, you know? Yes. We'll turn off the nukes and then turn them back off again without <laughs> actually having to be inside the facility. Yeah. yeah. And they yeah. couldn't even do that. They were all individually wired and circuited so that if one went down, it didn't necessarily mean they all would. In fact, you couldn't shut them all down. There was fail safes against that. So whatever was doing it was trying to show them that your very advanced level security is child's play. We could yeah. turn them off, it, turn them on. They remind me. Think twice. Absolutely. It, it reminds me of a movie growing up was The Abyss. Yes. Oh, you remember? Okay, great. I remember The Abyss, yeah. Yeah, I kind of, I, you know, I aged myself with that movie. I mean, I think I was 10 years old when that came out. And it was just this uh, underwater entity that was uh, interested in the new power that we had. And, uh, you know, as all this starts coming out and I listen more, it just kind of reminds me of that movie, The Abyss. And yeah. I kind of always get asked, like, what did you believe in growing up? And I was just like, well, my favorite uh, alien movie was always The Predator. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope it was. I hope that guy, well, whatever was in that cockpit of that thing, isn't the predator right because <laughs> yeah we are done yeah we'd be done but yeah. do, you, do you think these things um at this point like what's your feeling towards it do you think that it's a possible threat do you think it there's no threats there like as a person who served in the military for 10 years like what would your opinion be on this at this point with the military background i would say probably gonna get a little blowback for this if you have the the strongest capability on the yard, you're gonna always be a threat, right? You yeah. know, it's all, it can't always. The fact that they are turning off uh, nuclear capabilities, I could see. Now, if I was a top person and that thing shut off our nukes, I would say, hey, that's that's a threat. You know, you know, I I, I listen to, uh, I, you know, it's like the what is it, Mr. Elizondo says, the muddy boot prints muddy muddy boot prints you know you wake up one day and, and you see these boot print marks in your home yeah. yeah but nothing is broken nothing is stolen but yeah but you knew somebody was, was there. in there yeah yeah so yes uh but it if it is a threat they could have done it years yeah. millennia ago that's my thoughts if they yeah. wanted to enslave us or just take over yeah. why do they have to toy with us we don't toy with an animal that we're about to slaughter and butcher to consume right no we get we it over with. Yeah. it's very it's very cold and calculated you know that's a nice way to put it i guess but if they wanted to they could and jason always says you know if they're abducting people just for experimental purposes and they don't have any sort of heart within them, they would just shoot us out the airlock. They wouldn't bring you back and tuck you in bed nicely and maybe erase some of your memories. So it didn't traumatize you. So sometimes it seems to have a little bit of benevolence and a lot of abductee survivors, they, they, some of them say that it felt like a warning or some type of a, a conversation, but they didn't have threats of we're going to kill you. We're going to take yeah. over yeah. very few people that you hear from that are legit uh, actually say that more of them say it felt neither good or bad, or it had kind of a positive upswing to it. And then some people, it just messes them right up. You mentioned your friend that was praying. Kevin Day didn't know what to make of it. And then, you know, it, it can be a, a downward spiral for some people because of that, because it's it changes everything you thought was possible. Absolutely. And the beauty of it, I haven't really dubbed into the uh, uh, abduction, but I have listened to the children from the, uh, I guess, it, it guess uh, adults now from the aerial school. Yeah. Yeah. We interviewed the, the uh, executive producer of that, Randall Nickerson. Yeah. And yeah, to this day, those kids are all in their 20s or 30s now, and they're still saying the same, the same thing, right? Nothing's changed. Yeah. Wow. Wow. 
what's weird about that too is that it's the consciousness aspect of these crafts like there's there seems to be a consciousness to them so the way that they move the way that they behave like you know fighter pilots control the plane but it's with their you know the joystick or or you know just uh the buttons and everything like that these things seem to operate on almost like just a thought like i want to be here and you're there and i want to be here and you're there right like it's just yes. it's got this fluid motion to it that is different than our technology uh lou already knows this but when i was a kid I, I seen one up close like 80 feet above my head and that was like solidified it for me that was like everything that people have said is true the buggers are here and it was this very sort of like oh wow like look at this thing look at the maneuvers that it's doing like it wasn't a big shock at the time but now that i think of it i was like holy crap like that was amazing to witness yes. so I, I figure it's the same for you is this an amazing experience not threatening at the time like you're not you don't feel threatened or anything but you're you just walk away from it going what the hell was that because that absolutely that is uncommon right it is i that's good description i mean it had no yaw or pitch to it it was just instantaneously like you said it, it wanted to be there it got there and it took off when it wanted obviously just like any man-made aircraft but you're gonna have to have acceleration and this power and this thrust yeah but it's just instantaneously and, and it, it was like this white illuminescent you know almost like an arc welder's light is the best i could do but from a distance so I didn't see any like disc or anything. It was it was almost like the object was like producing its own energy. You know, I like it had this power surrounding it, like an aura or something. And it just was wham, bam, boom, and it was gone. It was yeah, it's beautiful. It was great. You know, I, I wish I would have gone on that tear in the sky and I get to see that again. I was like, oh man, I heard that from you guys now. And I'm just like, oh man, I wish I could have seen yep. that even on video again. And some of these videos that come out, I look and I'm like, man, I know these guys got some HD. For sure. For sure. Oh, yeah. Some HD video. Give me something good, man. Because yeah. if it's a general public person that sees this, I kind of have a, a, a general idea what I'm looking at. But if I try to show them my wife, she's like, well, what is this? Yeah. You know, yeah. What is this thing? Yeah. And the famous videos everybody's familiar with, you know, the Tic Tac and the gimbal, they appear to have that fuzzy energy around them as well. Now, yeah. even on infrared and maybe, you know, even better being on infrared because you get that heat signature and they don't seem to produce any. They, they seem to be colder than the surroundings. Yeah. And you it's know, the higher ready. you go, the colder it gets. Like in an airplane, you're going A to B. Even in the summer, it's like minus 40 outside at 80,000 feet or 40,000 feet. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the lack of apparent heat and, uh, you know, no, no control surfaces, no propulsion. Lou Elizondo talks about those five observables. You know, they can go in between different mediums. Instantaneous acceleration not you know that's not supersonic or hypersonic it's like jason said it's the speed of thought it's yeah. not even the speed of light uh so the deeper we go into this thing the more bizarre it's and then maybe it's not even physical craft coming from other planet maybe it's interdimensional and they're just phasing in and out so wow. it's stranger now than ever but you know i've always felt whether <clears throat> if it's extraterrestrial or terrestrial right that means here in our planet where are they hiding right so they have to be hiding in our oceans or, or you know i hear things of the mountains or i mean just now i mean they just found all those pyramids in brazil right i mean these things can be hiding there and yeah hanging out I, I, you know we'll, we'll we'll never truly know and no one's an expert and you always get all these blowbacks and fighting on twitter and what what is what who is who and you know it's just a dangerous realm sometimes it's well, twitter, it. yeah. twitter's brutal I, I i don't know if you're on there a lot but it is brutal like, i read it it's the kumite <laughs> it's oh it's crazy like i've just figured you put these people in the room everybody's punching each other like it's just so much hate um for a phenomenon that we're trying to f figure out in a minute, since somebody 2017, comes out. right? Since 2017, this kind of all gets disseminated out. Yeah, yeah. Well, even uh, Chris, just... 
it became snowballs. its own entity. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. snowballs. But Christina Gomez said something recently in an interview. I was um, on, on David Scott's uh, Space Out Radio, and she mentioned, you know, we've been waiting for years to have this person come out of the government saying, hey, these things are real. Um, here's some video evidence, and I'm going to try to push the, the agenda to bring this out. And then the minute he does, he gets attacked, right? Yeah. Which he knew this was going to happen. But I mean, we're all waiting for him to come out to say something. And he does. And everybody turns on him like his credentials aren't there. And even Senator uh, Harry Reid wrote a letter saying, yes, he was part of this, yeah. uh, you know, uh, investigation. And I just I feel bad for the guy because he's gotten attacked left, right and center on Twitter over. Talk about Lou, right? Lou yeah, Louie. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just feel bad because, you know, like my, I'm hundred percent with Lou on this one. Like, uh, I think he's legitimately saw some stuff that, uh, he would like to see the light of day for the general public. You know, I thought he was going to, uh, drop out of this. Like, man, I, I, I don't scared. need this. You know, he's got 30 years or more for, for our government. And I thought he was just saying, you know what, F this, F yeah. you guys. I'm sure tried, he wanted to. <laughs> I'm sure he has come close a few times. Yeah. Yeah, but he's out there giving uh, Zulu foxtrots to all this. And yeah. I think you guys know what that means. And he's uh, still in the game. So yeah. good for him and everyone else. That's that's the beauty of this. Since, since 2017, even before when I started digging into it, before uh, TTSA, I've only had told maybe five people, I told about five people about this. And it wasn't until I was reading Annie Jacobs' book of SR-71 and Area 51. And in that black and white, it said, and I think it was the uh, intro to it, mentioned Area 51 and UFOs. And that was the first thing I read that I was into I said UFO and I just started researching more and I only found like maybe two or three podcasts of the subject and a lot of old school uh, people are still around. But now since then, the beauty of this is one thing that I think everyone can agree on with the multi generations that we have, not even in, even in our workforce, but just as our country is that we're all talking about it. Just like that young lady you mentioned, Christina Gomez, yeah. um, the Rogue Report is another one. And there are multi-generations of videos and interviews with these people who are all talking about it. And that has really expanded since 2017. Yeah. But sometimes you get one of those two, three people that just want to be the one who's got it all. Yeah. This is my, I've been talking about this the longest or, but you know, that's just human nature. I can give egos. everybody yeah, you know, a pie yeah. and not everyone's going to like it. Yeah. You know? It's the height of human ignorance to say there's definitely no such thing as aliens. It's also the height of human ignorance to say, I know for sure there is. So you have to have that humility. And again, we're trying to say yes or no to something we don't even have a clue about, even if it was confirmed. Yeah, these are aliens. This is their craft. We would have no idea how that thing would even run. Like if they're hundreds of years, thousands of years more advanced, even millions of years more advanced, it would be indistinguishable from magic as a very famous quote. Yeah. Um, you know, like, so it, it, we're very good at trying to say it's definitely not, it definitely is. Everybody needs to chill out and have some humility because we don't know. And uh, the only way we're going to get there is by sharing everybody's ideas collectively. Yeah, definitely. definitely. The cool thing of all this is that, um, I've actually taken notes, not there when, when I'm listening. I've met <clears throat> multiple people, you know, through life. And um, just recently I was at work and uh, I was at the mechanic shop for uh, my company, it's UPS. And I was talking to the mechanics and uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, something to do with our, our system, UPS. And I saw this alien sticker on one of the uh, mechanics uh tool tool chest and i and i kind of look i go you believe in that stuff man and he goes uh kind of and he goes congress is talking about it today and i looked at him and go oh you do you're really into this stuff and he goes yeah yeah i just kind of really started and i was like hey um i kind of don't go around saying i was like why don't you youtube my name and he goes excuse me 
And, you know, he jumped on his phone and he looked at me, he goes, you were on the Nimitz? He goes, man. <laughs> and it, then um, he began to tell me why he was into it. He had a siding as a young man. This guy's uh, about a little bit younger than me. So he's in his late thirties. I'm 45 this year. He was 12 years old. He had a siding. East, uh, West Texas, heading home to go see his grandmother. And uh, he saw a triangle. And on the bottom, he said he saw like this white uh, bulb, half half dome. And the triangle had, you know, lights at each point. And it was hovering um, and it took off. He was with his youngest cousins. They saw it too. They still talk about it to this day. And then fast forward, maybe about a couple of weeks ago, um, I was at my in-laws house and uh, they found out also that I was on uh, unidentified. And um, this is the strange thing. I hear these stories from multiple people who are from the country, meaning, um, you know, rural country farmland. She said the same thing that she saw a triangle with a, a bulb at the bottom and it was white and it had lights on each corner. And I just was like, holy, these people don't know each other. Right. And I know they're not intertwined with this. And then when they tell me these stories, you can feel that they're talking to someone who had also seen something. So it almost feels like they're getting something lifted off their shoulders or their yeah. chest. So it's like a me too movement, um, but, with, but with UFOs, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And I keep saying that it's like, it's now time for the people that have had these experiences to come out and say me too. Like I've had this experience and yes. uh, even, you know, I joke around this quite a bit, but you know, once people find out that you are into UFOs and you take it seriously, they're all like, oh man, let me tell you this, you know, like either I've had a sighting or my grandfather had a sighting. Everybody knows somebody that's had a sighting. It's just once they, they can figure out that you will take it seriously, then they're willing to share it with you. But I think we're all conditioned to be like UFOs. Ha ha ha. You believe in that stuff? Like, even if you believe in it yourself, you're sort of like conditioned to say that to yeah. people almost. Right. But yes. we're getting to a point where it's like, you damn right. So I wear it proudly. I put a bumper sticker on my car. Like, I don't care. I believe in that. I don't care who knows about it. Right. <laughs> I haven't shut up about it since I was like 13. So I'm not about to now. It's too late. <laughs> well, too that's what Omar momentum. just said. You know, he sees the sticker on the mechanics toolbox. He's like, hey, man, you believe in that stuff? Knowing full well that you were on the TV shows and on the Nimitz. It was yeah. a point. And as soon as he's like, yeah, kind of. You're like, OK, you could talk to me. I'm a safe okay. person. Google me. Yeah, yeah. What that's see, awesome. Man? Tell me all about <laughs> it. So we all have that filter first, you know, like we tell our friends are like, what do you mean you guys have an alien show? Yeah. And then we show them and they're like, Oh, wow. Like, well, yeah, I believe in that. And I think maybe it's this and that. And we're now safe and they can share. And yeah. I think that's a big compliment. Definitely. I mean, even uh, after my sighting, I told about four to five people, man, I got laughed at. I told my closest buddies, you're full of shit, general quarters, what? And uh, even now that it's out there, you would think I'd be like, man, look, I saw this. I was on this TV show. No, I'm kind of just mellowed about it i'll let someone bring it up or or there are people at the at the job site that do follow this stuff and they'll send me ancient alien stuff and you know just cool things that, that they like to see and they always ask about it and it's a topic of conversation but you're right i mean as we were saying earlier it is out in the open but it's almost like that subculture yeah you either have to be a believer or an experiencer for someone possibly to open up or ask yeah. of the subject matter. Because after I got uh, put out there in 2017, and then when Mr. F Commander Fravor came out, and now uh, I think there's a young lady, uh, Dietrich. Yeah, Alex. Got, Alex yeah, that's awesome. Him. Yeah. I sent uh, all these videos of them doing their interviews to those five that group of five people with my middle finger up and i was like <laughs> i told you that something was going on yeah and that's what i did to my buddy rick palmer too in the beginning but he he didn't really reply to any of it and it was kind of very quiet but uh i i believe he he did retire but at the time in 2017 he was working out of dc so he was 
higher up there. And uh, I don't know if he was willing to come forward or say anything. So what are your thoughts on the Congress hearings? So we've we've had, you know, what, one or two, I think, at this point? Yes. Uh, and they showed this really fast clip, which we all, like everybody, every ufologist makes fun of because they didn't have the, you know, uh, a still of the picture. You know, I think the, the object is only like one frame within the whole shot and they couldn't even zoom in on it. Or, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's just a yes. really fast uh, moving object. Like, well, this is what we get. These are the reports we get. And I'm like, bullshit. I bet you it guys is. have way better footage than this, right? Uh, but do you think that's just a way for them to sort of ease the public saying, look, you know, we're looking into this, but see how fast these things fly. There's really no uh, pure evidence at this point. Do you think it's just a ploy for the, the, the people or just to put us on basically just on the bench to wait for better stuff? Probably a combination. I think it is like a little sprinkle throughout uh, our society but it, it just kind of i think for us like do we really need our world governments to tell us what yeah some of us probably do believe in and what we know is true that's the kind of uh pushback i give is like why do you have to believe the government yeah you know and why do you have to have the government tell you but that's just our mindset, you know. We live in a, you know, we're free thinking societies. Um, are you guys are you guys both in the states, correct? Uh, we're in British Columbia, Canada. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, yeah, you know, we share the same, you know, free thinking. We can wake up and say, you know what, these things are all angels, or, or these are all entities from hell, or these things are from Brazil, you know. And yeah, it's like we're such a free thinking. Uh, part of the planet that you know sometimes i wonder like why do we need them to give us an explanation on, on what this is you know right. I, I honestly think it, it's it'll probably dissem not disseminate but maybe not crumble but just kind of edge some of the religious beliefs we have out there yeah because uh you know we're all taught at one point in time, I'm not a religious person, but you know, there's people out there that, you know, hey, this is Jesus, this is God, or, or, or something of a higher power protecting us humans. But this, these objects and these technologies, it's, it's kind of beats that. It, yeah. I hope I'm saying that correctly. It kind of puts a, a an edge and a cut through maybe specific religious belief systems, and I've heard that that even Mr. Lozano got pushed back when he was debriefing somebody and the guy tells him, hey, have you read your Bible? Uh, you know, he, I, I heard that and I listened to a lot of his interviews and he said something really interesting. He said, the truth whispers if you just listen. So he's always kind of throwing these little tiny crumbs out there. And it, he always said the major pushback he got was from... Um, the uh, the old guard, so yeah. to say, and I got that from Vinny or, or the UK. The old guard in their staunch belief on, on you know maybe our, our religious standards, and I mean even in our politics now. I mean, yeah, the Roe versus Wade thing is you know one thing about God, and but I don't want to go there. That's yeah, <laughs> that's it's... another. Forget well, that. <laughs> I, I can I can comment as somebody who is a spiritual believer. I was raised yes. in a quote unquote religious family. We weren't out, you know, preaching to other people or knocking on people's doors, but right. we believed. And I, I don't see it as a conflict. In fact, if there were aliens, that would reinforce God, quote unquote, whatever that looks like, because yeah. it would prove that this is a love only force, a creating only force, nothing but positivity. So what would say that, yeah, God loves so much that there's creatures and life everywhere. Why would it just be limited to here? And I think when we get too religiously political and we focus on the hierarchy and man-made rules when it comes to the application of belief, i.e. religion, that's when things kind of get screwed up. You now have people playing God saying, this is true, this is not true. Yes, the Bible right. doesn't say this or doesn't say that. Well, the Bible, if you believe it, the Bible has a creation story, as does all major religion, but it doesn't say this is the only world. This is just the story of our world. 
So it doesn't refute any of this. And if I don't, I honestly don't see how if you're religious and you find out aliens are real, that's going to screw everything up. I don't get it. I don't think it would. I think it would reinforce it. Like, hell yeah. Proof that God exists. Look, he's created all kinds of stuff, you know? So um, I think it's when you come from a faction that is very rigid and very, hey, if you don't believe that to the word or to the dot, you're you're a deviant and you're missing it. I think we get too wrapped up in like looking at the forest this close. We're not seeing the entire picture. And anytime man is trying to speak for God, that's a problem. So for me, in my own personal opinion and my two cents, and that's about all it's worth. But my two cents is it would encourage that. It would prove oh. even more so there is other creation besides us. Because if we don't really understand our own creation, how are we then going to understand other things creation? And like, do aliens believe in God? It just gets this giant wormhole. But uh, <laughs> I think it would more reinforce than, than damage. Oh, that's a, it's a beautiful thought. That's beautiful. Well said. You're, you're, you're correct. It, it, um, I, you know, I really don't have anything else on that. It, I, I truly believe whatever it is, it, it is a force of, of good, but I've always felt like, man, like we said earlier, if they wanted to mess with us, they could have done it millennia ago. Yeah. To me, it's yeah. an advanced uh, consciousness. That's what they are. They're an advanced. I hear that in, too. In yeah. Consciousness. Yeah. Like uh, they say that all the time to abductees or like even to the kids in aerial school, like the advanced in consciousness, the fact that this little entity is able to talk to each one of the kids individually just by looking at them. Like that's an amazing thing telepathically, right? Uh, yeah. Each kid got a di- different feeling or a different vision from these things. That is an elevated consciousness that's able to talk to lower consciousness. So that's, I think that's one of the aspects of ufology that, you know, is starting to, for me, come to the surface is because I didn't believe in that before, you know, the whole CE5 and stuff like that that people are doing. But I'm starting to put to, two and two together. And even when we're talking about how the, the crafts move at the speed of thought, well, that's just consciousness, right? So the fact we're dealing with, consciousness that is not human that is something different that's the exciting part right because how how different are they thinking like you know how different are their thoughts from ours right uh and that's how they're able to come up with the technology that they have they don't see things the way that we do we're i think quite limited in our brain capacity our understanding of of technology where these things maybe are prone to be more scientifically awakened than we are and understand things to be able to manipulate physics and materials in ways that we can so that's why they're able to go through eighty thousand feet to down to five feet above the water or right into the water um even louis you were mentioning they were going up to 500 kilometers yeah, 500 an hour, plus like miles that. an hour underwater and our best torpedoes are just around 200 or slightly over 200 miles an hour so yeah and, and I mean, water is a totally different medium from air or yes. at the atmosphere, you know, so it's way more viscous. The pressures are huge. If you're going 500 miles an hour in the water uh-huh. before long, you're at a depth that we would need special rovers to even be at. So yeah. it just doesn't seem to affect them no matter what medium it's going through. And that's that's one of the five observables that Lou Elizondo pointed out on his show. Yeah, yeah they've really focused that uh, five observables for my show. Uh, from my initial interview from there yeah i remember uh i mean my interview was uh four hours long close to i think it was like two and a half three hours long oh wow yeah they they really uh cramped it in i guess it was like six to seven minutes of tv time but right isn't that weird how they do that yeah i think they kind of were getting a lot more other information um i guess from you know the other perspective of, of the individuals that were next to me and what happened and 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 you know just kind of like what i'm disseminating now to you guys their reactions and the public's reaction but I, it, well one thing i do remember is uh they were late i, I showed up 15 minutes early and then it didn't start to another four about 30 minutes after i was supposed to be there and I sat down and they had this big old camera in my face. And the first thing the young lady says, she goes, I'm really sorry, I'm late. And I said, man, I've been waiting 17 years to tell this. And I looked at this thing, I go, now this is real. I mean, look yeah. at this, it's here. Is good that a good you, feeling? Good yeah, that, you. it's gotta be a good feeling to be able to get that off your chest and 
uh, I was nervous much, even yeah. even to this day I, I even I still get nervous uh talking about it I, I try to figure out why and <clears throat> you know but great shows such as yourselves and you guys with the intro you guys gave me and you know, just kind of ease into the process because even like I said, I don't really go around saying, "Hey, look, I was on this. Look at this. Look at this. I saw this." Right. It's still not easy, really, to, to talk about it sometimes. Nice. Well, we thank you for coming on the show because that's uh, that's a huge deal for sure. No, well, I appreciate it. We, we like people that are credible, people that have had uh, legitimate uh, experiences, and most of all, encourage the any personnel in the military that. If you've seen something, yeah, come forward, right? That, that's really the, the military personnel. It's you guys that are helping the disclosure because, you know, we listen to you guys during service and you're saying, look, during service, this is what we experience. Um, you know, you got my full attention at that point. Like, you know, I, I believe you're, you, like I said, you're a credible witness. You know exactly what you're looking for. So, yeah, that for Louie and I, that was a no-brainer. We, like, we have to have this guy on for sure. Nice. Do, we, do you have any questions for our, our guest? No, I just want to say again, big thanks to Omar for coming on our show. We appreciate it. Uh, you're a solid dude. You're, again, very brave. And uh, if you can be uh, uh, an example to other colleagues that are questionable whether they should say something or not say something, I hope they, uh, they follow your example because, uh, um, you know, without that, this disclosure doesn't move forward. And uh, it's just civilians talking. And that's what it's been for 80 years. So you guys really <laughs> took it to the next level. I can't thank you enough for being on the show, man. And I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on, guys. Anytime. And just before we uh, close, I just want to say uh, hello to Rainy from Cuba or Renee from Cuba. I don't know quite how uh, to pronounce the name. I haven't heard it uh, audibly yet. But uh, a listener of the program and really big supporter of the program. So we appreciate it, my man. Omar Laura, we thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Is there a, a place people can find you online? Like, are you on Twitter, Facebook? Uh, Twitter, I, I kind of just dub into that Twitter just to f see what's going on and what. Yeah. But I Twitter would be the easiest. It would be the easiest one. And what's yeah. your what's your tag on uh, on Twitter? Oh, geez. Let me. Uh, it's Eternal99. Eternal99. Yeah. Perfect. All right, guys. So I would encourage you to follow Omar on Twitter. And uh, Omar, once again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, my man. We really appreciate it. Gentlemen, thank you. It was great. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, take care.